Hello, this is Dr. Dan. In this video, I'm going to help you put together an IRB exempt review application. The first thing that I do is I work with students to collect all the necessary documents, which are quite extensive to some degree, I guess, here. And they'll include the, uh, the actual application, biographical form, city training, a license if you need one for, let's say, a measure that you're using, published measure. Uh, if it's a quantitative study with a survey, you'll include that survey, hard copy of that, as well as a link uh, or survey recruitment message. And then finally, once your study's over, it's a notification of completion. So I, I, will, I will create a file. I'll start collecting these documents from the student. I work with the student to help ensure accuracy and, and so on for these different forms. So let's go ahead and begin, and I will show you the actual um, application form. Here and I'll bring that over. There we are. So we have our folder prepared. Now we're going to um, begin to fill out our form. Attention to detail is critical. I cannot uh, uh, stress that more. Even uh, misspelled words will very likely get your application returned. So attention to detail is very critical. Type in the title of your study here, then the student's name, student's phone number, the student's email address and affiliation. Continuing along, the type of degree that the student is pursuing. In this example, it's PhD in Industrial Organizational Psychology. The faculty mentor would be the chair of the committee. In this case, it's myself, my email address, my affiliation. Then you list the faculty members that are on your committee, maybe one or two, depending on the program you're, you're perhaps in. Um, more than likely, if it's a dissertation and you've got to go through an exempt review, it'll be two committee members. The expected dates of the study. This is something that uh, students will sometimes not uh, consider, and that is how long it may take before the actual study is completed. Uh, that will involve perhaps weeks, if not maybe even a month or more complete the RV application, then of course get the data collected, analyzed, and so on. So you want to uh, make sure that this date goes well in advance, well farther out than you may even perhaps expect to complete that project. There's nothing wrong with that. Study is funded by self, unless for some reason there is a, a external other funding source, which is, which is not common. Um, you do not also perhaps want to uh, uh, receive compensation or you will not be receiving comp compensation and or own a, uh, a business uh, or position of authority and the location of the research so that that could be problematic so you want to look at these carefully uh, these are all like I said very uncommon it is a complete application uh, conditional could be for instance if you need a conditional application because you need that completed because you go to let's say another school to collect data from, but they also want an IRB application. So you gotta get yours conditionally approved, you go to the other location, they then approve, then you come back, and then you, you complete the, uh, the application process. For this example, we are conducting a survey and where identities cannot be revealed. That's our basis for this exempt application, so that box is checked off. You want to carefully review these to make sure uh, that you perhaps do not fit in, in other categories. Now as we scroll down further, make sure you use the title that is the same as everywhere else. I've seen it before where students will have a title at the beginning that is different than the title uh, here uh, for their overview of the study and I, I, I have them do the exact same thing so that way uh, very clearly that title should reflect the overview of, of the overall study. That's, that's all that's typically needed. If the title does not reflect overview of the study, then this would be different information. The research methodology, you'll notice that many of these, including research purpose and so on, are, are very brief, direct, to the point. So this example is a correlational design that studies these constructs. The purpose, to determine if there's a relationship between the constructs, very precise. What will be required to study participants? The most commonly, uh, the most common error, if you will, I will see here 
is that students will list uh, a time that maybe will be much longer than it will actually take the participants. So in other words, this one I actually changed, it was 10 minutes. However, when you actually take the survey, it actually only takes about four. So maybe for some slow readers, we put four to six minutes. And then just make sure that that information is consistent throughout your entire application. I'll show you examples in a moment here. Then answer if deception will be used, uh, if audio video recording will be used in the study, Provide a link to that survey. If you're going to use, for instance, SurveyMonkey, provide the exact link. Uh, make sure that that survey can be taken multiple times by the same person because IRB will be taking it multiple times to determine, for instance, if items can be skipped, which you should allow. You should never require that a participant complete an item. And so there again, you want to make sure that, that uh, your committee and the IRB can take that survey multiple times. Continuing along very precisely um, how that information will be collected. If you're going to use social media, state exactly which social media outlets will be used, in this case as well as email. The jargon, that's just again your main concepts, what they are. Here we keep them very simple. The number of anticipated participants. I will often explain to students that there may be a minimum that's needed for certain statistical procedures, but there is also a desired amount. That desired amount should come from the literature. For example, if there's five studies you find in a journal that you want to get into and it takes 300, or excuse me, there's an average of 300 participants that are in all of those studies, that would be justification for the number of participants that you should perhaps um, uh, try, to, try to obtain. Some students will also add to that number. Um, they will factor in, let's say, 20% uh, rate of, of incomplete surveys, so add another 20% uh, to that. Age range, with that range of, of ages for the study, 18 years and older for this one, the gender, males and females, male, female, other, and so forth, where the study is being done, who the study is being done on, and then here's something that I want to uh, draw some attention to, required forms for the application. What you will notice is that the, the uh, file I have here is, is numbered. One, twos, three, four, five, so on. This order, you will see, begins with the application, then bioform, city training. If you look at the checklist, you have not just the application, but the bioforms, city training, and so on. So I keep the file that I store the documents in, in the same order, by using numbers like this, as the checklist in the application. And that helps the person that's reviewing, so that way all the information is in this order. And then finally, once you have all of your data collected that you need um, and this application completed, then you sign it, give it to your chair who also needs to sign it. I actually had one refused one time because I forgot to sign it. So you want to make sure that these are, these are completed. All right, so now what is the next thing that we do? Well, we do have our application now completed, we go back to our, our checklist, which is on that application. I'll just use this file for now. The next thing is the bioform. So I'll show you two examples here. So the first bioform that we have here is from a student. And then we also have a bioform here from, I believe I have one somewhere here, from uh, myself. See here. Sorry, I'm looking on their screen. I don't want to share information that I should not share. Uh, let me see your bioform. Here we go from myself. So what we have here is the. Uh, whoops, I guess this one was also faculty. So I'll get you a student example. Sorry about that. All right. So here's what we have here is in the middle. You have the students. So the researchers, a student. The principal investigators, a student. Then the title of the study. Here is the example I was telling you before. Make sure this title is the same as the actual application. And make sure this title is the same on, let's say, the faculty member's example over here. My example over here, just make sure that title is consistent among all of those bioforms, because you need one for all three of your committee members, including the chair, as well as yourself. And here you would include uh, education, your role, in this case, doctoral student, principal investigator, very brief role description, very brief qualifications, sign that form. All right. 
So back to our checklist. Now we have the four bioforms in this example. I know I only have three, but we would have four of them in there. Now we have, we need to collect not just the student city training, but all the city training from the committee. In, in this case, I help the student collect both bioforms from the committee as well as city training. What does that city training document look like? Let me go ahead and pull that up for you. So what we have here is you complete, in this case, we in psychology are completing a social behavioral educational research group. You would complete this, make sure that the date is not expired. So in this case, this would be expired, as you can see right here. Uh, the student's name will be on it, the Kaiser University, student's email address, the unit, and so on. And what's important here to understand is not, not that you just show the scores, but that those scores are 80% or higher. If you do have a lower score, you need to retake it until all scores are 80% or higher. Uh, once you get a new report, if you did score lower, it may reflect on this first page. However, on the second page, then it will reflect the most current scores. So just keep that in mind. All right, the next thing that is needed, we go back here. So that's our city training. We'll get that from the faculty. Um, that's your chair, your committee members, also from the student. Now, if you need a license to, come to uh, use one of the surveys, if you have published measures, here's an example of what that looks like. Uh, this is for the MASLAC burnout inventory. A student needed that, so they got permission to use that. Going back to our checklist, we also need a hard copy of that survey. So in the application, we had the link to the survey, but we also want to have the actual uh, hard copy of that survey, meaning like a PDF file. At the beginning of that PDF, there is a, a template in the IRB uh, organization group, meaning where the IRB, app, IRB applications are submitted, where all the information is, and so on. And they do have an informed consent that you need to use in this example for a survey, uh, word for word, without exception, um, and I shouldn't say, I guess, without exception, other than where you put identifying information, such as led by a student, meaning um, the student, or if a faculty member is doing the study, led by them, and then the, uh, the student or faculty's name and address towards the bottom, as well as if there's a faculty advisor. Now, continuing along, I'll just try to point out maybe a couple important things associated with the actual survey. You need to have an informed consent, something for them to click off, saying that they understand and agree. Uh, some faculty require this. However, I've been told by IRB never require an answer for anything. Where that would be justified here would be supposing someone wants to just take a look at a bit of the survey before they agree to the informed consent. So I never require anything, uh, uh, never require answers to any of the items in a survey. Continuing along, make sure you have your instructions for the measure, make sure all of the items in the measure are spelled correctly. If there needs to be periods at the end, put periods at the end. If there needs to be question marks, put question marks. Make sure that the spelling of the scales are correct and the scales are consistent with the instructions of the measure. Make sure that uh, if it only requires one response, not saying that the item is required, but if someone does respond to the item, and only one response is needed for the scale that they can do that versus more than one. Again, further emphasize spelling, consistency, numeric values, all of those very consistent, very accurate to avoid any potential problems. I have seen before where there was one word misspelled. Uh, it was not accepted by the IRB until the student changed that one word. That resulted in a delay of about a week. So all of this information we will go through in great detail to check for spelling errors and as well as other errors. And then once we do that, then we, are go, then we can go ahead and uh, once everything's corrected, we can go ahead and, and uh, save the PDF copy and then get that prepared also for the overall IRB application. Uh, it, you should note also that there is some, um, some information that you will learn along the way that your, your chair should be able to help you out with if you're a student. Uh, if you're a faculty member and maybe other uh, mentors. For instance, what gender do you identify with? 
This would not say what gender are you because gender is self-identified. It, it could say what sex are you, male or female, or it could say what gender do you identify with. So something as simple as that needs to be addressed. So again, high attention to detail. What is your age? A problem I've seen with that in SurveyMonkey, there's a slider option, but if the slider is not properly designed, once you start sliding this over, this number here will go to zero. It'll start at zero. So you have to make sure that everything works. So make sure you take the survey multiple times before you actually get it ready for IRB, just to make sure everything works. Back to our checklist, that was the survey. Now we have a survey recruitment message. This is the message that, that individuals will get, basically for you to um, ask them if they wanna participate in the study. What I have my students do is prepare three messages. The first uh, reason why three, three is sort of, I could call it like a magic number where if it's four or more, that might be too, uh, um, might be too, it might be just too much for potential participants. It might be um, almost to some degree bothersome for them or you're harassing them. So we don't want that. So what instead we do, and two might not be enough. Okay, so we have three. Three is kind of a magic number. And what we do is prepare these messages. I have uh, future students use pretty much the identical message depending on the nature of their study. I did wanna highlight here that, again, the, I mentioned this earlier, the time for that survey and the application, if we said there four to six minutes, we wanna make sure this also says four to six minutes. That's an error I've caught before. Make sure you have a link to the survey that works. Thank people for participating. In the second message, we want to perhaps wait a few days or a week, depending on the nature of your study. If you haven't completed the survey, we ask that you, you know, hopefully we'll be able to do so within the next, and we give a time frame, next five days, next three days, next 24 hours, whatever it may be, to try to prompt that individual to take the survey. And then finally, after the X amount of time, we send the last message thanking them for participating. And if they did not want to, part or if they did not participate yet, uh, one final opportunity before the survey will close. Here the, the student says we'll close soon. I would put a firm date so they know this survey will close this evening at six o'clock. And finally, um, this is the entire application package that's all put together. There's one more document, but this document is not used until after the whole study's over. I just wanted to point this out, notification of completion of protocol. That's done after the entire study. Now, what do we do with all of these files? Uh, so what the faculty member will do, I guess in some cases, maybe the students do themselves. I, I do this for the student. I've collected all this information. Now what I will do is go to a right here. I will use this website right here where we click on this. And what it is, is this, uh, uh, PDF tool where you can select all of your files by clicking the button select files it will go to um, go to all my files and in this case it will go to this right here this file I will click on all of these files right here which will be added to this press convert and it will create one long application with all of those files and that's done the final step is then in turn going to here's Here's the IRB faculty copy where we submit the applications. We will then in turn click submit an application. In this example, I wanna submit an IRB application. I will then go to doctorate, in my case, doctorate psychology, and that is where I will submit the final application. After that, then we wait and we, applications reviewed, and if there are errors, we resubmit and keep doing that process until we get a, a basically a perfect application. Once approved and only once approved, and you have a protocol number assigned, th and then you take that protocol number, you change if you have an online survey, you make sure that you uh, uh, put the protocol number in that survey, now you are ready to collect data. I hope this video helps you uh, create a flawless IRB application. In this example, it was an exempt application. There's also expedited and one application for a full review, which can be much more complex. 
but this should give you some of that basic information that's needed to effectively complete an IRB application. Thank you.